Cool. Okay. So that gives you a little sense. Uh, and thanks for sticking around. Um, that was edited by Susan Forsta, who's in the audience videotaping us right now. Uh, edited and shot significantly by her. Uh, I guess a little bit of the background. Um, there were a series of projections that I uh, helped initiate, organize on November 17th uh, on the Verizon building as people were walking across the Brooklyn Bridge and the pedestrian walkway. Um, that became a, had, drew some attention from the press and was kind of a, became a, a thing, a, a story in the press. Uh, so out of that, uh, I was put in contact with a funder on how to do, and it was like the OWS bat signal, this 99% bat signal, so it became called. So we talked about a Batmobile, and that was back in December or January. And over time, we figured out, you know, I assembled a team from Madagascar Institute primarily who are all over this fair all the time. Uh, and we pulled together the equipment and then quickly formed an affinity group of Occupy Wall Street activists. Uh, Lucky and some other folks were, were there at that first meeting, about 20 people. And we began deploying the vehicle in March uh, of, this, of this year. And since then, we've performed, I don't know how many uh, actions and uh, and and just interventions in all kinds of public space on a for a variety of different causes. The idea of the van, what you don't see here up in the slideshow is I think some photos of, um, is the library. Uh, there's a beautifully uh, crafted little library and bookshelves. Uh, and the, the idea was always to create a spectacle uh, and then draw, to, that would draw people in for a conversation. The library being you know, really kind of powerful symbol of uh, shared knowledge, shared information, uh, and conversation uh, about ideas, uh, which was what the spirit of Occupy Wall Street really was, and we emerged out of that, that movement, that moment. Um, so we've been on the road for about seven months, and I don't know, hundreds of interventions since then uh, that all of us have had a, a various roles in, in doing. Uh, just recently, this was the Barclays Center. Um, did anyone actually, was anyone in Brooklyn dur during the opening, around the time of the opening the other night? See that huge beam of green light <laughs> emanating from the, the, it was amazing, blue and green, like a massive light occupying the sky uh, in this really obnoxious way, just sort of laying claim to the sky. And it was, it was sort of striking because, you know, that's, we've been thinking a lot about light projection and, and now it's being used, you know, for these branding purposes, of course, it was, probably has been. Um, so that's a really brief, brief, brief sort of overview. I thought, I, I know that uh, you guys want to talk a little bit about uh, sort of activation of public space, and I don't know, do you have your... Uh, I can... Hi, so I'm Natalia, and um, I joined the group probably around, I think it's around May, so I feel like a relative newcomer, but um, work a lot with public space, so it's a great interest to me. Um, and I think something I'd like to point out as well when Mark, when you're talking about the library and the role of it, um, is that on one hand you're seeing like a lot of street projections and people gathering around them and we've been working increasingly with communities to support pretty large causes, whether it's around, um, you know, student debt at NYU or like rent strike or labour rights in Brooklyn, um, stop and frisk in the Bronx. And on one hand it's about creating like a pop-up pop public space around projection, having people gather, working with community groups so they have like a, a platform to speak from. But what's also happening in the van as it's driving around or stopping is that we have the driver, there's a projectionist, and we have the library, which is only open, of course, when we stop. Um, but there's always someone also tweeting and trying to generate a lot of like social media storm around the event because often we find in smaller communities that don't, might not have the resources or don't, aren't given the airspace to be able to advocate for the cause, but there's some experienced media campaigners in our team as well. So on one hand, we're creating a public space right there and then, but it's also about exactly at the same time, um, you know, linking into social networks which we have and which everyone uses and are literate in um, to generate greater awareness. So the campaigning is on the street and it's also like in the online ethers. So, on that hand, there's sort of a van that encompasses the commons in many different kinds of ways. Do you want to add something? Yeah, I guess um, I've got my own mic, oh, so I'm that special. <laughs> um, yeah, one of the important things about space and the movement is that, of course, the Cody Park was this wonderful tent of conversation, right? And there were certain reasons why that was. As in people just knew when they went to that space what to do. You would go and maybe volunteer your time at the information table, you'd donate a book, you'd start a mic check and have a conversation about 
um, economic inequality. And I think that was one of the things that we had in mind with the van when the project started was how do we create that space but bring it out to people, these communities, most people who are disenfranchised or exploited by the current system that we have are not going to have the time to go to this park in downtown Manhattan and be there 24-7, right? So how do we go out to Bushwick or Crown Heights or Flushing? How do we go out to those areas and bring those qualities and really engage people and empower people? And so that I think most of the wonderful actions we've really done are not, like you've seen a few pictures here of the spectacular stuff like the Occupy tape on the standard and, you know, on independence or the 99% bat signal. That's all really cool, but I think the most powerful stuff we've done is when we've gone to the Bronx and partnered with people trying to stop, stop and frisk. And when we've gone to Sunset Park and, you know, help people who are uh, doing a rent strike there and project stuff in Spanish, etc. Because I feel a lot of um, the movement um, and that aspect is that with the current media system that we have, it has corporate, corporate special interests, right? And so a lot of these struggles aren't being supported or broadcast or well known. And so a real power of having this tool, this spectacular tool, which also generates media as well as um, on the street level and throughout, you know, dissemination, as Talia was saying, through social media, through tradi traditional media, is to make sure that we use the tool to really bring those stories that aren't being heard at the moment. And I think it's really empowering when, if you think about it, when you go outside, what is public space? You go and see, go to Times Square, you see the McDonald's arches, you see Toys R Us, you see these neon lights, are they inspiring to us? I'm not sure, you know, but we don't have much control over that, right? And so the great thing about this is that we can talk to people in communities and say, you know, what do you care about? And their voices are being seen in that public space. And I think that's really cool. Yeah, I, um, my name's Chris again. I kind of, I got involved in the project in, I think, May as well. Uh, around, or no, before that. Yeah, maybe February. And uh, I was looking for something that was, uh, well, rather, I'm doing graduate school at the new school, so I was uh, in a class called Civic Media and Tactical Design and was in the process of de developing um, some project that was going to involve projection in public spaces, and it just happened to like happen at the right moment. Um, I got involved uh, with the Illuminator at that time, <clears throat> and like uh, Lucky is saying, though, I think that, y yeah, it is very empowering to project in public spaces, um, it's, it's very empowering when we go out to boroughs. Uh, the project that I worked on was actually in Manhattan, and uh, we performed it for um, Parsons Art and Odd Places Festival, and it was a, centered around student debt crisis. So we projected like facts and figures um, on the Salvation Army building. We had uh, one street to choose our location, and uh, we posed the question, what does student debt mean to you? to the public with a phone number, and then people responded by text messaging their uh, answers in, and we, we projected them in real time, but also collected those responses. So, but it was fascinating to see the, the amount of like critical dialogue happening on the street. People were, in, um, you know, just going home, or sort of intervening in, that, in their everyday life in, as a way to create that dialogue. And, you know, m maybe some people uh, left, you know, they had changed their minds about it or something, but the point was that people were talking. Uh, so I, yeah, in that sense, it's, it's a very powerful tool. Uh, yeah, I mean, they pretty much said it. Uh, <laughs> it's great to see media mapped back out onto the streets. I think a lot of <laughs> radical dialogue has been uh, sort of uh, centered on clicktivism and things like this in the past couple of years, and that's upsetting, and I don't think it really you know, does, does as much as being there in person and starting conversations on the streets, so. Yeah, I want to respond to something Lucky said. I mean, there's something about making the invisible visible, like in a very literal sense. So whether it's, you know, people who are fighting with their landlord in Sunset Park and are on rent strike, and nobody knows that, what's going on in their own neighborhood half the time. So actually putting that up on the wall, you know, we live here, and, this, and these are the problems that we're facing. Or hot and crusty workers who are trying to unionize and getting, you know, and they're trying to close the hot and crusty, or the, you know, other, other workers, but these struggles that are going on all the time, around us that we never, we're never aware of the struggles that are going on. And this is a, just a very, you know, kind of immediate and clear way to sort of shout it out visually. Uh, and it's sort of nimble. It has this sort of nimble, agile quality. We're not trying to like wheat paste or put a graffiti, just throw some light out, you know, roll up in the van, blast it, take a photo, 
and have that photo hopefully begin to spark some dialogue, spark some, spark some dialogue in the street, but also, um, you know, online obviously as well. And some of the photos have really gone viral. And has anyone seen photos of these, any of these images like traveled through their, their Facebook accounts or something like that? Uh, it's been, it's been kind of remarkable. Some of the, I mean, Facebook gives you metrics. I don't know how, how reliable they are that they estimate, you know, that like 400,000 people saw the free, pu free pussy riot um, uh, image that we put out there. So, you know, half a million people saw that, which is pretty striking. Um, and, yeah. Um, I think uh, something which which I've noticed, like, because we're driving past and people are like, well, fist pump and we're like, we love the Illuminator. And even just being parked here, people are like, oh, the Illuminator, we love you guys. And I think what's... Um, I've been finding really important is this coming out of the Occupy movement and there being this sense that, oh, they're just these, like, hippies or, like, derelict people who are down there just causing trouble in Sukoti Park. But actually it's a form of activism which is incredibly positive. We even have a Spotify playlist we started because we have also a sound system which we can play. Um, so the whole idea is to give, um, you know, a sense of optimism and positive energy towards a lot of these causes rather than to be all about, oh, our life is crap and, you know, something has to be done about it. But um, to rally around, you know, a spirit of um, optimism is, is, I think, something which activism really needs, especially in this day and age. And I also I think it's interesting sort of how people sort of stereotype activists, right? Especially with the Occupy movement of, they're those people who were in this camp and they have the privilege or time to, you know, sort of sit around and bang on their drums and not really do anything. And so I feel like, creative forms of activism and technological forms of activism are really important in that way because they really bust that myth, right? All of us have day jobs. We, you know, it's remarkably hard to go out and illuminate every night as like a four hour, five hour stint. And then sometimes you're dealing with the police and then you're dealing with the technical issues and figuring out how to, you know, project well on a surface, etc. And so I feel like people are really surprised and I've had some crazy moments like driving around Philly, having people heckle and say, you know, get a job. And then you go, I've got a job. I'm a molecular bi biologist at Cornell or something like that. Molecular so, biologist. Yeah, which, which is my day job. <laughs> like, um, so it's, it, I think it's really important to... <laughs> um, sorry, I'll, I'll fix that later. Um, in terms of to have this public face, it really has this engaging public face for the movement and it's sort of, the bat signal was legible, but it's as much as the people inside. So what we do is we pop out that library, right? And so it creates that space for, because we don't have a storefront anymore, we don't have an encampment. So it's one of these uh, creative solutions we've come up to make sure people still have access to the movement. Um. I, th I think I'd like to sort of give it over to you guys for questions, if there's, if I hope, hopefully there are, or discussion, you know, if there are suggestions for actions. I don't know. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, target selection. Um, sometimes it's the, the, uh, <laughs> You start to we joke we joke about this a little bit. It's like you, when you're doing this for a while, you start to see you start to see everything as a canvas. You start driving around and like, oh, that, oh look at that, oh, look at that, oh, oh yeah. So you're con constantly sort of thinking, and we'll use the long throw lens there, or we we'll you know like just constantly sort of like viewing the cityscape in a different way. And it's interesting how that changes your relationship to the city. Um, but a lot of the I think most some of the more successful ones are are sites specific for political reasons. So like a you know, hot and crusty, or the Russian consulate. Um, uh, in terms of uh, nervousness, there have been some seriously, yeah, there's been some strange and dicey moments. My craziest one, and, and Lucky probably has one from the Spectra pipeline, that was a kind of nutty moment. Um, but on tax day, we were trying to, we projected onto Rockefeller Center, it was about GE, you saw that in the video. And we pulled over a couple blocks away and we're setting up and it was like a no standing zone, but we were there and we were parked and we were, you know, waiting. And a, a, a cop drove up and parked in front of us and it was a white shirt, meaning it was a lieutenant, um, not, a, not like a routine beat cop by any means. And he, he, we were, there was a group of protesters who were with the Tax Dodgers, which is a street guerrilla theater group. And they were like actually over there like a few blocks away doing their thing, kind of, and we were gonna sync up. It was gonna be sort of a syncopation of the action. And, and we were kept on ice there for 45 minutes. Like, 
they were just like checking the plates again. Can you show me license again? Can I see the registration again? You know, we're gonna give you a ticket. It's taking a little while. Yeah, it's just the computer's down. They just just kept us on ice, and they knew what was going on two blocks away. They they you know, they figured this out. I'm sure by that point, and we just finally like I I I was in contact with with the other crew, and I was like, it's off. They're just gonna they're not gonna let us go. Just go, and we we're we're, we're not. It's not gonna happen. Um, because they they were just not gonna let us go. So then they, as soon as I did that, they they might that might they might check that information to the crowd two blocks away. They're like, sorry, the illuminator's not coming. Sorry, bye. We're gonna go. And so the people started started to disperse. Then they gave us the ticket. They gave us you're on okay, you're on your way. Go away. See you later. And they gave us the ticket and they let us go. So they obviously had somebody in the crowd, um, the, a cop who like we let okay you can you can let, you can give them their ticket now. So so like we I immediately called them back and I said we're coming we're doing it anyway and they're letting us go so like we like, and went for it and like drove like and then took a right and put it up on that building and they scrambled and got some people there and the same white shirt that had been harassing us came over and like smiling almost like it had been a, like a weird game of cat and mouse and he was like yeah guys you can't do that what are you killing me and uh and we sort of like you know joking laughing I said we're doing this for you guys you know G's not paying their taxes it's affecting your kids school and um and he said and he and he said you know I support what you're doing but you know you you, you can't do this so he basically let us finish, and then we went on our way. We were there for like 15, 20 minutes, which is all we needed. Um, but it was very, I thought they were going to impound the vehicle. I mean, they were, they were, eventually, it was not just the white shirt, obviously, but it was him, two other squad cars, guys in flak jackets. There were like seven or eight cops, three cars. You know, you know, whoa, you know, they, they responded. <laughs> um, so there are other kind of nutty stories. Yeah. Yeah, that, that question comes up a lot. Are there, is there a lot? Somebody in the audience actually did a little research for us on that question. Our legal counsel over there, Paul Siegel, um, uh, did a little legal report. Uh, there, as far as we know, correct me if I'm wrong, there are all kinds of laws that they can deploy um, or they can apply in these situations. There doesn't seem to be a law against projecting light against surfaces unless it's a window of someone's apartment, in which case it's trespass. Um, and if it's advertising, then you need to have the permission of the building's owner in order to pay. You have to come to a contractual agreement with the building's owner in order to advertise. Um, so that would be a, that sort of law. Uh, and there's a law against having a light brighter than 32 candle power unless it's an emergency vehicle. That is apparently part of the vehicular code. Um, but the police don't know the law. Um, and it doesn't really matter what the law is. I think the best response that... We've got the most sort of typical response in some ways is when we say, like, well, what law are we, can you tell us what law we're breaking? Can you tell us what law we're breaking? And the police respond by saying, well, if you're going to make me look it up, I'm going to impound the vehicle and take you in. So if it's sort of like, you know, you can beat the charge, but you can't beat the ride. I mean, it's sort of an, a truism that, you know. So if they tell us to stop, we stop. We don't, we don't get into arguments about the law with the police because the law doesn't really matter as much as their ability to impound the vehicle which is sort of a checkmate. Yeah, they have a funny little routine that I notice every time they do. So the spectra action that you mentioned was when they brought up the whole illegal light fixture candle power thing, because <laughs> obscure law that they chose to implement. But I see like there's a team now, right? So there's a person who goes up and stops the vehicle and says, what are you doing? You probably need a permit for that. And you go, what law are we breaking? And then he tries to stall and say, I'm pretty sure you need a permit. And then there's some guy who scurries in the back and is on the phone going, and then like, I've had friends and when Mark was stopped, um, I had a friend just randomly walking past for the GE action and he had on the phone, they were going like, what can we get them with? Um, they're parked legally, so we can't get them on that, you know. His hat, their seat belts are on, so we can't get them with that. And so it's literally going through a list to see, you know, what they can get us on. And then, as Mark says, at the end of the day, they're going to threaten to impound the van. So apparently, for the Spectra action, the orders they told us and threatened us that the orders came from the commissioner himself on that night. Is um, that what they, they said? The, the commissioner, yeah, sent us that's... here to stop. We were projecting on the standard, and it was for a good thirty minutes. So you know, we find that there is a lifetime of danger, I guess, which is about 10 to 15 minutes above that, then, you know, they'll start to try and track you down. And then if you do crazy things like, for that, that was an environmental action against the construction of the Spectra pipeline. So we were actually literally following a march, a pretty, you know, 200 person march for a while, projecting all around the meatpacking district. Awesome action, but that's sort of high risk. And so 
you know, we don't tend to do those high risk actions as much as sort of the outreach function of going on a corner and just projecting on a blank wall is a bit safer. But sometimes we do it, and it's always interesting to see the responses to them. Uh, yeah, well, we, the 99% um, the stickers are magnetic decals. So those, come, those can slap on or slap off. We do have stealth mode um, when we don't have the stickers on. Um, but, I mean, there is a library painting. There's like a nice <laughs> painting on the side of the door, and it says the illuminator across the side. I, I don't think... I, a lot, I don't think it's really the... It's about maintaining order. I think with the NYPD, it's just about, oh, you're doing something, and we just don't like what it... Just stop. Um, and that's pretty much, uh, you know, and then you, that's pretty much it. I don't think they even care about the messaging a whole lot. I mean, it doesn't matter. You're just doing something you're not supposed to do. People are gathering around it. Stop. I mean, that's pretty much the way, go, the way that goes. Yeah. Just one van. Wow, that's... Interesting. Apropos, we just we just had a Kickstarter campaign to raise funds to in, to help seed a project in San Francisco and to continue our own project. We're replacing the gear. We have to replace all this gear because, believe it or not, the the funder of the project is pulling the plug on it, um, taking the van back to do something on his own. So we have to get a new projector, and, and we're probably not going to do a van again. We're probably going to do something on bikes, um, a little bit more, you know, less less material. Are we like close to time? Is Okay. All right. <laughs> this guy and then this guy. We use this same model for the November 17th projections, with, uh, borrowed from Rooftop Films. It's a cinema projector. It's 12,000 lumen. Um, it's the most affordable model of that power that we could get, and we got one used from a guy in Colorado who was a friend of a friend, and he had he had the lenses, some special lenses. So, you know, just you know, just yeah, scrambling a little bit, finding a good deal. You need you know you know something over 10,000 lumens is probably what you need to do the kind of thing that we're doing. Um, Bigger is a little better. Should we go? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, how did you find the new series of the series? Illuminator 2.0. 2.0. Yeah. So, what's the process for that? Like, where is the collaboration with all of them? Is someone who will back that? Like, where is the collaboration with them? Are you doing something? We sort of haven't really begun to talk about that. We've begun to talk about that a little bit. There's some super geek guy in Minnesota. His name is Steve. I don't know anything else about him, um, but he's yeah. He could, hey, hi, Steve. How you doing? <laughs> Sorry, did I call you a super geek? That was as a compliment. Here at Maker Fair, that's a deep, profound compliment. He he uh, he's done some bicycle powered projectors and some other. He's designed some stuff. So we're gonna look at that also. Um, uh, yeah, I'll probably talk to Hackett. I'll probably talk to some folks at Times Up and. These guys, I don't know, Juan, uh, you probably don't know Juan, this guy, Juanqui, Juanqui. what's his last name? Um, you know Juan. Uh, anyway, he's done some mutant bike building, some crazy mutant bike. I know some other, there's other builders too, to come up with some kind of design uh, that would allow us to get the van around, maybe on two bikes or a tandem, so there's more than one person trying to lug this thing around. Yeah, we're starting kind of from scratch. We're, we, need to, we need to figure out what our budget was and then, and then begin to design stuff. It'll be kind of, I think it'll be interesting. It'll be fun. And there was one more. Yeah. Are you worried about the again, like this is like a plan? Do it in the same way that like when we want to go to start or just move on, but at the time it's about and getting it, but it's very difficult to make not because it's a mess in itself, but because it's a mess in the system. Hmm. Do you have a role that there's this film where, oh, that's the thing, and then you want to just like that's like that thing you're doing. And then you have the possibility of this this counter movement and you have something Wacky, 
Um, anybody else want to take that? Do you want? I mean, I, 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 my, my brief answer, my, my brief answer is that we just do a lot of different stuff. We don't do one thing. Uh, I think um, I don't know that we're that well known enough to be like, you know, oh, that's the Illuminator. I mean, there's a lot of people here who haven't heard of us at the Makers Fair as well. Um, but I think uh, some of the recent actions that have been taking place have been about giving people a platform to speak, and that's what we try and do through our outreach and by partnering with local communities. So if our brand is letting communities speak more easily for themselves, then bring it on, <laughs> really, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I guess I'd just say that that links to the way Occupy affinity groups in general work is that you know you don't want to speak on behalf of people. It's all about connections and the more collaborations you do, and that, that's what we've been doing. Is we we don't go to a community and like project you know on behalf like messages that we just make up. We ask them what do you want to talk about, what's important for you guys, and they're on board in the van and you know helping with the design messaging and doing all the flyering outreach. So I feel like that idea of having a brand is minimized because it's not a small central body of people making that decision. It's a delocalized connected network which is making the decision on messaging. Yeah, that could happen. We have the, we have the technology. Um, there's interactive technology. Chris uh, is aware of this, and, and Grayson could probably design something pretty quick. Um, there's modules we were actually doing that where people could text in and they could project it immediately. So that can that can happen real time, or it can happen very quickly just in the van with Lucky just typing on a keyboard. That can happen pretty quickly. Yeah, yeah, so far. We've done yeah. the SMS thing as well. Yeah, I've done the SMS thing as well, but we usually come up with it ahead of time. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for sticking around.